Hey. Hi. Hey, JB. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. And you? Good, good, good. How's everything over there? Perfect, perfect. Uh, starting some, some holidays now, so it's really good. Good, good. Is the COVID over there? No, it's, uh, it's still running. Uh, we have uh, remote islands, uh, French islands, where it's really bad. Uh, but in France, uh, right now, it's, it's pretty okay, but still not over. Did you guys get vaccinated? Yeah, yeah, fortunately, right now. I would say anybody who wanted to uh, had access to the vaccine. Good, good, good. Pro good. Problem is many people don't want, so that's a pity. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. I just finished my test. All oh, right. Yeah, everything's good. Everything okay? Yeah, everything's good. So, I'm going to start, okay? Yeah. So, JB, can you introduce yourself for the coaches in Taiwan? So, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's very good to speak to, to people in Taiwan. Um, so, my name is, is JB. Uh, the French name is Jean Benoit and uh, Maureen. And I'm a, I'm a full professor at the university. So, I teach sports sciences and training and I research in that area. <coughs> I'm also a consultant for uh, sports uh, uh, clubs or federations, uh, pretty much all over the world. And um, I'm also an editor for a Journal of Sports Sciences. So it means I, I manage the reviewing of, of some papers. And uh, so that's my, my full-time job. Plenty of jobs, in fact. <laughs> cool, man. So... Today, I kind of want to like focus a little bit on force velocity profiling because I heard a lot of like podcasts and read some research that you write and people in Taiwan isn't really familiar about the force velocity profiling. Okay. So first of all, can you like introduce the force velocity profiling, how to test it in sprinting and jumping? Yeah, sure. So um, what, is, what it is, it's, it's something that's always been there. It's just um, an individual characteristic of your, of your machine, of your body, uh, muscles, and system. And so it's, it's a way to characterize the, um, your ability to produce force in movement at different velocities. And um, to start describing this, you can say that anybody knows that you are not able to lift a heavy load as fast as a light load. Everybody knows that if it's light, it's going to be fast and vice versa. So this says that our muscles are not able to produce the same force at different loads and different velocities. So that's the, the, the beginning. So if you want to describe my capability of force at, at every velocity from no velocity, like it's so heavy, I cannot move, to maximum velocity, it's very light and, and I am super fast. You can measure my force output at different velocities. And if you do that, you will find a relationship. And we call that a profile. You could say relationship or spectrum. I like the word spectrum now more because profile means more than muscles and spectrum means it's mechanical. So the FV spectrum goes from maximum force to maximum velocity. So for example, if you want to measure that in jumping, you will have to ask me to jump against very high loads yeah, and even to push because at some point I will not be able to jump anymore. So you will have to go from my one RM or close down to super fast pushing. And super fast pushing means no load. It means even um, unloading. Because if you, if you jump with your body mass, uh, it's not super fast. It seems to be fast, but you can be much faster. Okay? Yeah. So this is for jumping and for sprinting, it's about the same. You have to ask me to sprint and to go from very low velocity to my maximum velocity. And the funny thing in sprinting is that we do that over a single acceleration. When you start from zero and you sprint, you push the ground at very low, medium, and very high speed. So this is the, so 
it's, it's been there. It's been researched for years. I mean, the, the first works showing a graph of the FV relationship were published in 1920 something by Archibald Hill and Furuzawa and his colleagues. So it means it's more than one century old concept, but it's been always there because it's muscles. Muscles work like this. So, like, if I use like force velocity profiling, how, I mean, how do you use it to improve like sprinting performance? So this is a, this is a big stretch because, you know, sprinting performance is much more than just my muscles force velocity profile, of course. But I would say that if you start with performance and you want to improve that, you cannot coach people and say, just sprint. You want to improve the 100 meter performance? Just do it. 100 meters, day in, day out. It will work, but at some point, you will have no uh, more improvement. So you will have to go into what makes your performance. Uh, and there, you will find at some point, what is your mechanical capability. So I, I will give you a very simple example. If I do your sprint profile, and let's say your performance on the 100 meter is 12 seconds, and I want to improve that. And I find that your maximum velocity is very low, and your maximum force output is not bad. I know that there is a weak point in your profile. And the idea is very simple, it's that yeah. <clears throat> if I want you to be fast, I want every part of the spectrum to be good. And if I spot some points that are weak, then I can work on that. Because at some point, if you are super strong at the beginning, and I work on that, first, you may not improve a lot, because if you're super strong somewhere, it means your margin of improvement is very small. Yeah. And second, if I work on your maximum force a lot, I will not solve the maximum velocity problem. And this is going to be the limitations. So people see the performance in terms of factors of performance. We could also see the performance in terms of limitations. Where is your limitation? Can I correct that? Yes, no. For example, if you have three kilograms of extra fat mass, this is going to be a limitation. And I want you to have a correct diet to remove that fat mass and boom, you will sprint faster. So yeah. it means that the limitation of performance can be very, very different between two individuals. And sometimes it's in the FV profile. It sounds like, it, it sounds like velocity based training, right? But with like, Yes, it's, well, it's every, everything is velocity-based because the, the force velocity profile is what is your force capability at each velocity of movement? And velocity-based training is um, what load do I, need to, uh, do I need you to use to perform at a given, in a given velocity window? So I would say yes. In my opinion, in many, many sports, um, training has been organized <coughs> around loads yeah. And it's practical, but it should be organized around velocity. Because, the, the velo in fact, the load will generate the context of muscle activity. Yeah. But the real point that influences force is velocity, not load. Load is an indirect way to induce a velocity condition and a given force. You see what I mean? So, yes, velocity-based training is... I would say another way to organize training, but I think it's a bit more accurate way. Because if you give two people the exact same load, this is very important. And you know that if you coach people, if you give two people the same absolute load, like 30 kilograms, or even the same relative load in percent of body mass or in percent of their 1RM, they will not push at the same velocity. Yeah except if they have exactly the same force velocity profile, but most of the time it's different. So it means if you work in terms of load, you may provide a very different stimulus. And you may do a mistake in terms of programming because, for example, you will be faster than I will be. But if we want both of us to work at the same speed, speed should be the stimulus, not load. Load should just be an indirect way 
to provide the same stimulus. And I think this is the main change in training that, that we see and that, that should be uh, understood by coaches. If you coach people by load, uh, you may have some, some stimulus, let's say, mistakes or, or improvements. So that's why if you're like going to train resistant sprint, you use velocity decrement instead of like how, like how much body mass, right? Yeah, I think that's what people should do. And I'm, 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 I'm the good guy to say that because at the beginning of our studies, we didn't use that. We used percent of body mass. <clears throat> But very quickly, we observed that give the same percent of body mass to two players in a football team, in a rugby team, and they will sprint at very different speeds, absolute yeah. speeds, but also relative speeds. So if we give to you and I 40% of body mass, I will run at about 50% of my maximum speed, and maybe you will run at 80% of your maximum speed. So I will do a very slow training and you will do a fast training. So again, the same load, very different stimulus. So, and other researchers like uh, George Petrakos or Michiel Cahill or Matt Cross uh, repeatedly advise people to uh, uh, know the load velocity equivalent. I say, if you know exactly for your athletes the load velocity equivalent, you can set everything in loads, okay? But if you don't know, you need to check first. But this is the, the big problem also is that load is very easy to set. You know, you, you take some kilograms and you put some kilograms. Easy. It's written on the disks. Velocity is not easy to set because you need something to measure velocity. And this is the yeah. big difference. I think if velocity was super easy to measure, nobody would use, would use load to program yeah. training. Everybody would yeah. use speed. And this is, yeah. what you do at the, this is what you do at the gym. Most coaches at the gym, they use a velocity sensor, like an accelerometer or, you know, you see what I mean? Yeah. So we should do the same. I, my my um, uh, fight is to say we should do, should do the same in sprint resisted yeah. as we do at the gym. It makes yeah. sense at the gym. It should make sense on the pitch. But, like, here's the thing. If, you, if we don't have, like, like, 1080 sprint how can we train like how can we train the velocity let's say how do, do i know i'm training like the 80 percent of their max speed yeah yeah so this is a this is an issue because let's say the um, the easiest tool right now is a radar and it's about three thousand dollars so i know it's it's a big investment but if you want to know the maximum speed of somebody and you have no money, you can use the MySprint app. That's an iPhone or an iPad app where you film the players and you have the average speed. And if you don't have this app, the cheapest way, in my opinion, is to time the players over five meters. So you, you use a manual timing. You will do a very little mistake with manual timing, but you know, it's, it's pretty accurate. And because you know the five meter distance, you know the top speed zone, okay? You, you observe that where is the top speed five meters. You time the five meters and you can calculate the average speed. So I would say just with a simple timer, you can have a rough idea of a five meter average speed. You know that speed is a plateau when you sprint. So, yeah. and we observe that the five meter split is very, very close to the maximum, the peak velocity. So in my opinion, it's not an issue with uh, technology. You can have, if you're very, you know, thorough and accurate, you can measure some speed with very simple devices. Cool. So on the force velocity profiling, there's like vertical side of it and horizontal side of it, right? Like vertical force and vertical speed, right? Yeah. And horizontal. What's the difference? Why is it, why is it like vertical and horizontal? So uh, it's very fun because it's the same muscles. It's the same legs. It's the same person. But um, we observed that the two types of profiles were not correlated. Uh, and I would say the higher the level, the lower the correlation. 
Yeah. So if you take some, you know, some random kids around, there will be a kind of correlation, but the correlation is not really high. So there's two explanations. First, it is not exactly the same type of movement. Okay, one is two legs, the other one is one leg. Yeah. Second, one is against gravity and it's a single push. The other one is not against gravity and it's a cyclic exercise. So it means, yes, there are technical differences and it's the same for performance. You know that if you take the jump eight of someone and their sprint time, with low level people, you will have some correlation. They will not be super high, but with trained people, systematically the correlation decreases. So again, there is always a correlation between two things. What I mean is that the correlation is very low. Yeah. For example, in high level rugby players, the correlation between jump eight and sprint time or the correlation between the jump and sprint profile that we've observed is less than 0.4. So it means that less than 20% of one profile is associated with the other. So it means it's very, very uh, independent at a good level of training. <clears throat> can I, can I, can I like think of it like this way? It's like if I'm training a high, like it, 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 it is like really like pro level athlete and have like many training years. So if I'm gonna like train the train them to be running faster, it's like a lot different with I'm gonna train the, them to be jump higher, right? Yes, definitely, definitely. And um, and if they have a high expertise um, in something, you know, it's going to be difficult to improve further. Yeah. But it's still possible because otherwise there would not be any coaches, any any training on the planet if 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 no improvement was allowed. Okay, so. Uh, the idea is then to say, where is the weakness? Where, where, where is the next step in, in training? We have observed some crazy stuff with uh, uh, elite rugby players. Um, they, they do strength training for years, jump training for years, and we change something in the jump training they do, and, and they improve jump performance. So it means it's never over, okay? But yes, uh, it's going to be, you're going you're gonna to have to um, be very uh, specific in, in the stimulus. Uh, if you take an elite rugby player and you add more jumping into their program, I'm not, I'm not sure that we improve uh, sprinting, uh, you know, significantly. You see what I mean? So yeah. um, there is still some improvements. If you do that with untrained people, yes. If you do some jumping oriented work, I bet they will sprint faster. But if you take them to the swimming pool or to, to some jogging every day, they will also sprint faster. You see what I mean? So, uh, yes, the, the, the specificity is important at some point. Yeah. <clears throat> so, can you, like, I know you talk a lot about this. You use how to, like, use my sprint to profile a sprinting force velocity profiling. So, can you, like, tell us about it? How do you use my sprint to, like, to build a Force velocity profile. Yes, yeah, so the, the app was based on a, on a very simple observation. If you film correctly someone running at, at 240 frames per second, that, that's, the, that's the frame rate of, of uh, current uh, iPhones and iPads, you can track their position over time. So if you respect the settings, if you, if you do as told in the app, you can time the 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 meters. And then the app will calculate the force velocity output based on, on, on a very simple mechanical model. Uh, the model is based on the fact that when we accelerate, our speed increases in a very clear, simple mathematical way. It's, it, this is fascinating. And from this model that has been consistently observed um, uh, for almost one century, we can recalculate the force output that's been, that's been produced. So I would say the app is very straightforward. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of the, of the app interface. So we created an Excel spreadsheet where you can, you can insert the times that the app gives you and the Excel spreadsheet will calculate the outputs and will show you the graphs and it's a bit more detailed. But this is how it works. You just need 
a, a, a 30 meter straight line, uh, good, good light quality and a good iPhone or a good iPad and that's it. But I, I want to mention that if you have a GoPro or if you have a good quality camera, you don't need to use the app. You can use the GoPro. You can use some free websites like uh, Kinovea or some video uh, uh, softwares like Dartfish. And then you have the times. All you need is the split times and the body mass. So you're not, uh, you're not a slave of Apple devices, although it's super cool. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna th I'm gonna jump to the next topic about like foot training. I I know you post some post uh, like a few videos about foot and ankle training. So why foot and ankle training? Well, I would say why not. <laughs> um, if you think about it, every movement. In most sports, like football, rugby, basketball, anything, track and field, obviously, is an interaction between your body and the ground. So you know that you're going to have to push the ground so that the ground will react and your body will move. That's, that's as simple as that, okay? If you want to dunk, if you want to anything. And the point is that the force that you apply is generated by all your muscles, but it's transmitted at the foot most, most of the time. So it means at the foot, you have the energy transfer or the lack of energy transfer. And the recent debate around the shoes, around the Nike shoes and all that stuff is in fact showing that what happens at the foot ground interface is key. Because if you lose too much energy at that point, your performance is going to be lower. And so the shoes give you more energy back. And this is why there is a debate, because they increase the energy that's back into your system. So I would say that if your foot was able to lose less energy, then your performance would be better. You, you see the, the logic behind that. So then the thing is that anatomically and physiologically, your foot is a huge amount of joints, bones, and muscles, and everything there is a source of good or bad energy transfer. And so some recent works in Australia by Luke Kelly and, and co-workers showed that if you anesthetize the muscles, this is fascinating works, if you remove the muscle action from the foot, the running, the, the jogging and the walking mechanics change. So it means the muscles in the foot are not a passive system that's useless. They are active, and they are useful to your gait mechanics. But now we are doing some studies to show if they are also useful to your sports mechanics, like sprinting, jumping, rebounding, change of direction. This has never been really directly, correctly investigated. And if the, if, if the answer is yes, then we want to see if training the foot muscles will improve your foot system and decrease the loss of energy. So your sprinting, jumping, change of direction, performance will be better. This is the entire reasoning and the entire hypothesis. Now I have my own feeling and my coach feeling. Uh, I have never seen a coach or an athlete telling me I started to do some work and to focus on my foot strength and I quit. I let it because it's not useful. So this is not absolutely not scientific evidence. This is what we call practical evidence. All the people who started to do it correctly found an interesting, an interest in, in following it. You see what I mean? The other yeah. point is rehabilitation. What happens when you have a, 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 an ankle sprain? What happens when you, have, you rehab the sprain, but you also rehab the foot because you want the machine to be you know, back to work? So at that point, everything makes sense. The practical evidence is clearly there. Um, and the scientific evidence is lacking. Because most of the studies that, and some Japanese studies did that, uh, they relate motor performance to foot strength. But most of the time, the foot strength is measured very indirectly with um, clinical tests, 
So we want to investigate that in, in more details. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. So I kind of like want to wrap it up with one last question. So between like force velocity profiling and traditional like periodization, if it's like for, let's say like novice athlete, probably like high school, high school athlete, do you recommend them to use like build their own for force velocity profiling, build the individual profile or like just run the like, let's say probably like linear periodization? I love that question because uh, I am doing research on something, but I am not selling that to everybody and say, if you don't do that, your, your training sucks. If you are young and if you want to build performance, you have to build the basics of the pyramid of performance. You know, the pillars. You have to have mobility, general strength, general power, and everything. And then when the pyramid, the pillars are there and, and you work correctly there, very likely the next steps in your program will be around, you know, digging deeper. Uh, I always tell some coaches, don't do the FV profile with these athletes because they have no ankle mobility. Work on that first because it's a big stone. You know the story of the big stones first. So I would say if all the big stones are set correctly, everything is okay. Maybe yes, uh, FV profiling and going more individual will be the next steps. You see what I mean? So yeah. I agree with some, some people critique the FV profile approach by saying, forget about that. It's useless. Just go with power and you will, you will uh, improve performance. I agree with that. If you improve maximum power, you will improve performance in jumping and sprinting. The problem is that what happens when you can no longer improve power? Maybe you will need to know where your power comes from and maybe you will need to identify your own limitations. And this is where every profiling will become interesting in my opinion. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, man. That's about, all from, that's about all my questions I have today. I really love your work, man. I saw Thank you. about like all of the video on YouTube and the like the webinar or the workshops on 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 the internet. Thanks. And, I really appreciate that. Yeah. So if there co if there is coaches want to like contact with you or they have further question for you, where can they find you? So ideally, you go to my website. The name is uh, jbmarine.net. And on my website, you have a contact uh, icon. And if you fill the contact uh, uh, form, it will, it will fall into my email box and I will respond. That's the, that's the best way. If you, if you message me through Instagram or Twitter, I may not respond. But it, because, you know, there's plenty of things going on <laughs> on social media. Uh, but if you, if you drop a message on my, on my website, then you will have an answer. Thanks, man. I know you've got a busy, busy week, busy, busy day. So thank you for your time. And the content was like really good. So I'm going to post it on, in, on YouTube like next week. And I'm okay. going to translate all this into Mandarin on the oh, next wow. few weeks. Okay. Okay. I trust you on that. I cannot check what you say, it's but okay. I definitely trust you. <laughs> thank you for your time. Appreciate it. See you. See bye. -bye. You. So that's all for today. See you all.